Voices from Oxford today is talking to Professor Mike Bonsall in the Department of Zoology in the University of Oxford. Professor Bonsall is also a fellow of St Peter's College and he is a great expert on the area of population biology. Can you tell us, Mike, first of all, what does population biology mean? What does this consist in? Yeah, sure. So this is about understanding how species change through time, essentially from an ecological perspective, where we uh, would monitor populations in the field or in the lab. We would want to know how, they, how their numbers change through time. And it's really important to know that, so knowing whether populations are growing, or particularly with climate change, knowing how they, uh, whether they're going to go extinct or not. So it's about characterizing that and understanding how uh, species change through the processes of um, resource competition or predation or through the changes in the environment. So it helps therefore in relation to preserving the diversity of life on Earth but it also has some very interesting uh, conceptual questions doesn't it? I mean why why do populations live a long time? Well, some populations that's right. do. So, <laughs> so that's right. So, I mean, that's been a, a mantra through um, ecology, which is a relatively young science. So ecology as a science was uh, first uh, characterized in the late 19, in the mid 1920s. So that's when it was first formalized. So it came out of what Darwin had been doing and all the natural history through the Victorian age. But then in the 1920s, a lot more uh, formal thinking about um, what ecology meant. and. And th from that came lots of conceptual ideas about how populations are regulated, which means how they are kept at a steady state, and how um, they persist over time. And essentially that, that has to involve what we, call de what we as ecologists call density dependence. And that essentially is how, the, as a population increases, its either birth rate declines or its death rate increases. And that comes about because of, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, to do with the way that resources are acquired yes. and competed for essentially, but those those that conceptual those conceptual um, underpinnings really uh, sort of like shape the way that we think about um, the world uh, yes. in in terms of biodiversity. So could one say there's a sense in which the population knows when it is too many, too few? Is that a, um, an incorrect way? Of yeah, I'm not it? sure. That's I, I'm not sure. So. We, we have to be careful with those sorts of ideas. Populations are made up of individuals and, it's an, 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 and individuals have individual behaviours, they have individual reproduction and that varies, they have individual survivals and those vary between individuals and we have uh, individual, vari uh, individual variation dispersal. So all of that stuff contributes, so it's how that, all of that behaviour, uh, individual behaviour then sort of like uh, adds up if you like or sums up or yes. multiplies up yes. to affect the, what, yes. the, what the population is perceived. So, it's, so why we can think about that at a population level, that's it tends to be what we we tend to focus more down on the individual, yes. and that becomes really important when we think about evolution, yes. because what we have with evolution, we have individuals that have a new strategy. So it may be that you live longer, or that you compete better, or you can avoid predators, and that yes. that's an individual characteristic. And what we look to see is how that gene or that behaviour that's moulded by genetics is swept through a population. So we see how it's, but it's always at the individual level. Yes. And what we measure is the you know, population consequences of that or the community consequences of that. Now, to be very specific though, for our listeners, who I think would like now to see here, what does <laughs> this actually come down to in reality? You work on some very interesting fish. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, we, we've done a lot of work on a very long, uh, on a group of fish uh, called rockfish. And there's about 65 species that live off the west coast of uh, California in the Pacific. We get one in the Atlantic but this, this group of fish off the off the west coast of California are, uh, are pretty cool in many ways and one of the really cool things that they uh, do is that or do uh, they, as a group is that they live a long time. Some of them live maybe 5, 10, 15 years as, as fish and some of them can live for over 200 years and we have been really interested in trying to understand how that how, whether, how that longevity uh, shapes the community structure of rockfish. How do they coexist when you've got some that live 20 years and some that live an order of magnitude greater for 200 years or so? And that's been that's fascinating. They're a, they're a fantastic group of fish. They're related to lionfish, so they're really well defended. They've got spines on the back. They're, you know, um, they're really colourful. But the, the other thing is that they're really slow growing really are really slow growing so it takes a long time for them to re reach m uh, maturity just like just like us essentially not that we live for 200 years but it takes a long time for you know to reach that point where they can start to reproduce and that has serious consequences for their population dynamics and for thinking about these um, these um, 
sort of more evolutionary ecological questions that we have. Yes, and you can pick up enough data to do modelling, as I understand it, that's because right. you are a mathematical biologist. That's too. right. So we, the, yes. the great thing about the rockfish is that they are, because they're so um, diverse and colourful and you know, exotic in that sense, there's lots of uh, natural history information about them. So we, and we know lots about their, what we call their uh, size-length relationship, relationship, so how big they get re relative to how old they are yes. or, how big, or how big they get to how, uh, how much resource they've got. So that's really... So that, so that helps us in thinking about this 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 problem, and one of the problem that's really motivated us from a mathematical biology perspective is thinking about well, how does this longevity, this difference in in how long they live, yeah. lead to as I mentioned the, how they how how you can get 65 species, essentially all in the same space coexisting yes. in the sea, and it comes down to thinking what we so we think about well actually as I said some species can live for a short period of time and some people some species can live for a long period of time so 20 years 200 years but then they've got to think about well actually how does that play out in terms of their resources how do they how how good are they at getting doing something else so it may be um, hiding from predators or uh, capturing resources or um, Yes. Uh, all, all, all other other aspects of their life histories and what we think about or their life strategies and what we think about is these trade-offs and one of the things that we one of the things that really drives this is thinking about how longevity how long you live trades off with uh, competitive ability or how yeah. good you are at getting resources yes. so you might have a long-lived species that's very poor at getting resources and because it's poor at getting resources it doesn't really matter because it lives a long period of time yeah. but then you might trade that off with actually the difference the, the converse of that is you have a very uh, short-lived species which is very good at getting yes. your resources. So this gives you your equation doesn't it? That's you right. You can have one term which is the longevity another which is yeah. competitiveness in that particular environment. That's right and, and, what, yes. and, and, and what we do with that is then we weave it into the pop a population dynamic framework yes. so actually with, rather than it being static we're, we're interested in dynamics we're interested in dynamical systems and that right. essentially means how they move through time yes. and with and when we so we can take this equation for competitive ability longevity and plug it into a population dynamic equation and yes. say well actually how then do the dynamics play out do yes. we get persistent populations right. and just as we were talking about then we can say we can do a sort of uh, in computer experiment where we would uh, invade or allow a different strategy to evolve an individual that has maybe a shorter lifespan or better competitor and just see well actually can you in, can you invade the system where the population dynamics are doing either going up or down or um, are um, stable yeah. and we can so that's that's really quite uh, a, a nice thing that's to be able to do and yes. need to do with the sort of like the mathematical techniques that we can do now something shocked me earlier on you said 200 years if you gave me a fish yeah. that you said was 200 years old how would i know yeah well, so that's just like trees actually they lay the right. fish lay down growth rings and but they do that in their ears and they have what are called otoliths so in their ear bones they'll lay down um these little the bits of um uh, bone structure and then they then you can count them just as you can count tree rings and um as i said one of the fish um, it's called Boccaccio. Uh, it lives a lot, as I said, 200 years. It was caught, and uh, when this fish was a baby, and Thomas Jefferson or James Madison was the president of the U.S. So yeah, you know that nice. puts it into a huge context, right? Yes. So even before Darwin's theory of evolution came out, this this fish yes. was a juvenile in the Pacific. You know, it was a baby fry in the, in the Pacific, and you know now it's on somebody's dinner plate. <laughs> Incredible. And, and referring to Darwin, you found, as it were, another archipelago, haven't you? I mean, yeah. this isn't separate islands. That's right. Separate pools. Yeah. No, I mean, the great thing about the yes. rockfish is they're like a what we call species flock. You know, there's yes. a bit, and it's about adaptive radiation. So there's a there's there's a bunch of uh, species that, that are sort of models for, you know, in the sort of empirical sense for thinking about these adaptive radiations. So yes. Galapagos finches on, on uh, that Darwin talked about in the origin, and there's another group of fish called the cichlids, which you find in uh, in Africa and sort of the in the lakes in Africa. And those 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 are species rich and species diverse groups. So you have lots of, with, particularly with the finches and the cichlids, you have lots of uh, species that do different things. Yes, so there'll be some exactly. predators and feed some in different ways feed in different ways. Yes. The rockfish yes. are, uh, are less uh, exciting in that sense, but are more exciting in the fact that they have this different strategy of, of how long they live. So that's, yes. that's, pretty, that's pretty nice. Just to remind our general viewers, 
Um, it was Darwin's experience in the Galapagos Islands with the finches, as you say, yeah. uh, having different beaks, yeah. different ways of feeding themselves and so on, yeah. appropriate to that particular island, yeah. that gave him the idea of this tree of life. That's right, yeah. Yes. So uh, so those, those, those finches all do different things. There, there was thought there was a single, colon, single species yes. arrived and the niche, the habitat was open and they've diversified into it. So it was one of the one of the ideas that he got from um, the, when it, from his voyages on the Beagle to um, to sort of like crystallise his ideas out yes. uh, in this. Another one actually was when he was reading Thomas Malthus, and Malthus was a, a political economist in the late eighteenth century, and had some interesting views about you know the differences between population growth and uh, agricultural productivity, and there would be dis there would be there'd become this distinction between how many people were on the planet and how much resource would be around yes. to feed them. Well, that's a classic population dynamic argument. And it, and is and Darwin was you know read as it as the words go uh, Malthus for amusement and yeah. realized in you know in the early 1840s that actually this idea of separation between resources and population growth could, would would lead to very intense competition all of the ideas that we now use obviously in population ecology so really really yes. sort of like important sort of like thinking yes. about um, how you can get um, evolution to play out in a population dynamic sense, and I think that's one of the things that one of the things that we have done. You know, one of the things we've do, we've we've done since Darwin is to do a lot of like uh, characterizing natural history. So identifying species, seeing what their behaviors are. You know, having those fantastic programs that David Attenborough puts out all the yes. time, right? Which yes. are great. Yeah. But actually, yeah. what Darwin thought about was this was a dynamic system, right? And it's only more recently that right. we've started to be able to weave back in to our theories of evolution, the genetic theories of evolution, this idea that things do change through time and that actually phenotypes matter just as much as genetics matter as well. Yes. And that's and that's a, you know uh, that's the sort of uh, approach that we take. We think about things at the um, at the population level and yes, how as evolution well as, the genetic as well as the genetic yes. level, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've one final question I'd like to put to you, uh, Mike, if I may, and I'm trying to relate this now to us as humans. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. We have experienced a phenomenal change in longevity, yeah, haven't we? That's that, right. That, yeah. And now the interesting question I'd like to put to you is that many of us are living well beyond reproductive age yeah. now. A sort of simplistic account yeah. of evolutionary biology yeah. would lead you not to perhaps explain. No, that's that. right. I mean, you what's that's our use when we are beyond that's our right. reproductive age? That's right. What's our use beyond our reproductive age? That's, that's a good point. Well, actually, obviously, the the simplest proximate explanation for that is we just become better at healthcare, right? So Indeed, if we move yes. back to the Middle Ages, you know, our longevity, we, we you know, living beyond 40, 45, you know, wouldn't necessarily wouldn't have happened. Happen. So it's clearly that, that, that's had a major impact on a longevity. And you can see that throughout the, throughout the world, there are lots of demographic statistics that demonstrate that yeah. increasing healthcare increases uh, life expectancy. But there are other pla there are other species on the planet where the, where that happens. So lots of mammals and birds show uh, extended uh, parental care or investment in beyond the point of, of reproductive uh, of age, and that and that comes down to thinking about well actually what do they contribute? What do they contribute to, the, to their offspring? And more importantly, what are they contributing to their grand offspring or their grandkids yeah. and their great grandkids? And that's the that's the simplest explanation that we can have for thinking about why um, why we see this. Um, evolution to sort of uh, post-reproductive uh, um, living, and, uh, and yeah, that, I think that's the, the simplest explanation. So there have. is an evolutionary advantage. There is an evolutionary advantage because yeah. you actually, you know, you share genes with your offspring, obviously, yeah. and you also share genes with your grand offspring. Indeed. So actually, if you, you know, the name of the game in evolution is to get genes into future generations. You get your genes into future generations. Well, if you invest in your your offspring, and more importantly, you often invest in the in the survival and growth of your um, of your grand offspring then you, you you're getting an evolutionary advantage so it's what Hamilton called inclusive fitness indeed yes. and Hamilton also yes. did a load of work in the, uh, that was done in the 1960s Hamilton also did a, a considerable uh, conceptual thinking about this this idea of uh, longevity yes. so it's actually very nice to think that you can actually you know the these two things were done independently but actually they, uh, there's a commonality uh, within them to think about how we, you know, how we explain uh, longevity and the and these and these uh, post-reproductive uh, 
a lifespan, yes. essentially. For our viewers, I should explain that Bill Hamilton was a very famous yeah. uh, zoologist yeah. uh, professor here at Oxford yeah. until very unfortunately he died in one of his yeah. trips to yeah. Africa, yeah. didn't he? Yeah. But he must have generated some of the equations that you used. Uh, yeah, so he, yeah, so he, uh, he had, uh, as I said, two two papers. One on the two sort of conceptual contributions, major conceptual contributions to the way we think about evolutionary biology, all within the space of a couple of years, essentially. So one on the so the uh, the the evolution of cooperation and social behaviours, and this one about how natural se uh, selection moulds senescence. And yeah, we those ideas um, again. He, they, he he embeds those in a in a population dynamic framework, thinking about uh, survival and fecundity and how you can trade those two things off and how they all play out, particularly for thinking about the evolution yes. longevity. So yeah, we yeah we all you know. It's, uh, building on that work essentially. So the implication for human populations for us as it were is that we should be valuing our grannies and granddads. That's right yes. and there are so many sort of proximate <clears throat> mechanisms of thinking about that the evolution of longevity right so there's like in just because of wear and tear you know your genes might do something really good in early life but actually they just become you know old and tired and you know, they're producing they may not they may not know, be able to regulate themselves properly so you, you end up yeah. with that and that and that's you know there's there's a lot of push to thinking about whether can we be extended out to 150 200 years but yes. you know there's actually there's physiological limits to that more as just as much as you know and those are shaped by evolution but there are physiological limits to you know the damage and wear and tear that bought any bodies whether you know whether the whether snakes or whether the rockfish or whether the humans yes. can actually withstand Sure. And that's really important when we think about the the sort of the evolution of these different lifespans. Yes. Yeah. One final question for you, Mike. You're obviously an extremely busy man. <laughs> <laughs> You're running a major yeah. uh, research program here in Oxford University. Yeah. How do you when when you do switch off? Uh -huh. Perhaps you never do. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. When you do, how yeah. do you switch off? What's um, the secret? Uh, two things. One is that I like to run a lot. So I like, so yeah, I'll go for long uh, runs. Longevity again. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's more just yeah. Uh, that that there's that, and I also yes. play the saxophone badly, uh, so that's one way of switching off and uh, irritating my neighbours and uh, my family, who are very tolerant of me, uh, making yes. a lot of noise on, uh, with my saxophone. So those are the ways I tend to yes. sort of wind down a little bit. Yeah. Well, Mike Bonsall, thank you thank very, you very much. much for talking to Voices from Oxford. Thank you.